You know, it's so intrinsic to our identity. Like, as I said to you, when I finished uni, I had a bit of an, an identity crisis because, you know, I, I was no longer a mature student. What was I? You know, I, I didn't have a job that I could say I'm, you know, I'm a civil servant or I'm a fundraiser or I work for this charity. Or, I, I, I struggled. And, it, you know, when we meet somebody new, they say, oh, and, and what do you do? It's such an intrinsic part of our identity. And I feel it's really important to be able to be proud of your answer. Lindsay makes such a valid point about your identity that you connect with in terms of what it is that you do and people being proud of the answer that they give in terms of when people say, oh, hello, what do you do? And it's such an interesting story listening to Lindsay and everything that she's achieved uh, through her early career and then going to university and coming out of university and then literally having a bit of an identity crisis and what she does next. Anybody out there that is either in a job or in business will find this interview hugely valuable. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Lindsay. How are you today? I'm very good, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, how are you? Yeah, I'm brilliant. Um, I'm really delighted that you've decided to come on the Share Your Story podcast. And just before our, before we went live, the preamble, uh, you did a little bit of interviewing on another podcast, but this is probably going to be your longest one, the first long podcast. So it thank is. you. Yeah. No, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. And um, the listeners get bored of my first question, but I'm going to keep repeating <laughs> it. Cause, um, so my very, very first question I ask everybody is, yeah. you're going to get started with telling us a little bit about your personal life. Where were you born? Have you moved around? Tell us about your education. Um, what did you study? Did you enjoy it? Uh, where do you live now? Um, yeah, all, all of that personal stuff. So people get a real good idea where you've come from, Lindsay. Over okay. To, over to you. Right. Well, starting with the easy bit then, uh, a few people will probably recognise the accent. I'm a Brummie. I was born in Birmingham and I've lived here all of my life. So that's kind of the easy bit. I've wow. never lived anywhere else. Wow. And that makes me sound a little bit sort of insular and parochial maybe, but hopefully I'm not like that because one of the things I really value about Birmingham is the diversity that we, we've got here. Mm. Um, and I kind of like that entrepreneurial spirit of sort of early Birmingham. One of the things that I'm also interested in is history. Um, but I won't go into that now because really I'm just talking about me. Uh, yeah, so I was born in Birmingham, um, always lived here, uh, went to school, first of all in Spark Brook, and then when I was nine, we moved to Kingshurst, which actually technically isn't Birmingham. They, they had this local government reorganisation thing where they, uh, Birmingham was kind of getting a bit too big, and they built a couple of huge council estates just on the outskirts of Birmingham yeah so we moved there when I was nine years old and I went to comprehensive school there and one sort of anecdote that always sticks in my mind about education is I, I'm, I'm old enough to have actually sat the 11 plus right and I failed it <laughs> <laughs> or my, Failed perhaps isn't the word we're meant to use when we're talking about these sort of selection criteria. Yes. But one of the teachers told me at the time that if we'd actually lived within Birmingham education area, 
I would have passed because oh. nobody in her class failed by more than three marks. So we all would have passed. Yeah. But because of where we were actually living, there wasn't the scope, that there weren't the places for us to actually go to a grammar school. Right. So, and again, I, I'm not going to get fully into the whole education thing. I'm no. not sure if that if that turned out to be a good thing or a bad thing. You, you know, it just is. Yes, yes. So sticking with education, um, I actually went to university as a mature student in my 40s. Wow. Um, I live in Selly Oak now, so I'm about a mile away from Birmingham University. And uh, I went and studied ancient and medieval history as a mature student just because it was something I wanted to do. Right. So, yeah, so that's kind of education-wise and my family. I'm married. I've been married a very long time. We just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Wow. Um, yeah, it is a long time, isn't it? 40 years. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> we have two grown-up children. Um, my daughter is uh, married with two children of her own. Um, she's she's a lovely mother. She has um, a five-year-old uh, son um, who is absolutely adorable, a wonderful character. And she has a newborn, um, well, two months old now, um, yeah. baby girl. Wow. Um, and I also have a grown-up son who still lives at home. He works for, oh I should, before I move on I should say my son-in-law uh, my son-in-law runs his own tech business um so he's doing really well um and they're you know they're obviously very happy with their new and growing family great uh, my son is in his early 20s and he still lives at home he's an apprentice no he's not an apprentice he's mm. just finished and passed his apprenticeship at Jaguar Land Rover Wow. Um, so he's an engineer with Jaguar Land Rover now. I've got to stop saying he's an apprentice, haven't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, we're, we're really proud of our children and what they've yeah. done and, and what they've achieved Brilliant. Um, and amazing. how they're doing. So, yeah, so I guess that's, you know, home, education, family, um, yeah. Wonderful. That sounds really interesting and <laughs> did you um before you went into university yeah. um which was obviously in your 40s you said yeah um when you left school did you then you know did you go and get a job i did um i i stayed on for sixth form uh, because I'd, I'd always been quite ambitious and my dad my dad was an engineer um but he was more on a – he was a semi-skilled worker with um, Joseph Lucas, which, again, at the time was one of the big – you know, people will have heard of Rover or Austin Rover or British Leyland in Birmingham. Yes. Um, but Joseph Lucas was one of the sort of big supply chain companies um, that was also a big employer in Birmingham at the time. And he was a semi-skilled worker with them. Right. And he'd – always wanted me us probably I have a younger brother and sister um, to to do well in life he always wanted us to get good jobs and you know get a good education and go on and get good jobs of course. but I don't think it would have occurred to him that going to university was a possibility for us at that age yes it, I'm talking about the 1970s, and it mm. wasn't a thing that girls really did back no, then. No, um, I mean, it was, but probably not in working class backgrounds, which mm. is what we were, you know, working class council estate, factory worker. Mm. It wasn't really a thing that was – I don't remember it being a thing at school that, you know, our school encouraged us to go to university. No. Um, and for myself, my own ambition, I'd always wanted to work in an office. Yeah. And 
again, the, the common sort of ambitions for girls back then were teaching, nursing, or getting married and having children. Yes. They were the career options. Mm. And I, I was never really attracted to any of those as a career. Um Although later on in life, I did become a teacher of sorts, but but not a teacher in school. No. The the sort of, my ambition, as I say, was to work in an office. And I had this vision of myself in, you know, sharp suits and a nice briefcase, even probably back then. Mm. But I always remember in what would be year seven now I think yeah first year at secondary school and um, so the equivalent of year seven as an 11 year old a teacher Miss Eleanor asking me what did I want to be when I grew up and, and I can't remember why she asked me this and it wasn't a sort of group exercise because I can see myself standing at her desk so it wasn't part of the classroom activity mm. And I told her I wanted to be a secretary. Yeah. And she said to me, and I and I love these words to this day. She said to me, why do you want to be the secretary? Why don't you be the boss? Yeah. yeah. And I just, oh, little 11-year-old me hadn't considered that that was a possibility. No. So I think even since then, I've always found always considered myself to be ambitious and wanting to get a good job and to do well at work. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so obviously a, a sort of career idea was an option for me. Mm. Um, my very first job actually was a Saturday job. Um, I lasted two days in that. <laughs> it How was come? a little, I, Why was, was that, Lindsay? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was a little fast food place in Birmingham. Um, right. And it, I think it was called the Hasty Tasty. And on my first day, they put me on the ring donut machine. So it was this massive machine full of all this hot fat mm. and the machine kind of dispensed the dough and it was meant to be in a ring shape. Yes. Only when I operated it, they weren't so much ring shaped. They were very squidgy and like, deformed and <laughs> some were massive and some were too small and none of them worked really well. <sighs> so the second day... Um, they, they, they did let me back after that, but the second day they put me on the candy floss machine. Oh no, that's that really is difficult. So <laughs> difficult. It's really hard, um, and I just couldn't do it. Um, yeah, so they let me go. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I was only at fifteen at that point. Ah, uh, I know. Yeah. Um, and it, I just, it just wasn't me. All the sort of machinery and trying to work things, just it just wasn't me. No. My next job was another Saturday job, um, and that was actually at Woolworths in the ball ring in Birmingham. Um, and if people look up Woolworths ball ring, you'll see like the 1960s ball ring. There's loads of pictures out there of, you know, the Birmingham City Centre past. There's loads of pictures of that Woolworths. Yes. And that's where I met my husband. Wow. Um, he he was also, um, he was at college um, and he was also there working there as a Saturday lad. Yes. And again, this shows you what it was like. The, the girls were, Saturday girls got to work on the counters and in the stock room, it was the Saturday lads. Yeah. The lads didn't work on the counters. They worked down in the stock room, you know, provide mm. bringing stock up to mm. the counters and everything. Mm. And we only actually met because my friend from school worked on the ice cream counter there. So she used to have to go up and down to the stock room. Right. Um, but we, I was on the makeup counter. So I never actually went into the stock room. No. Um, but a group of them were having a, a sort of 
uh, Christmas get together and I got invited along at the last minute to that so that's actually where I met my husband <laughs> uh, but to bring that back around to the career angle I, I did that Saturday job for about nine months and yeah. probably while well, I was in sixth form and probably while I also yeah I'm sorry you asked me about school didn't you so sixth form I did stay for a year in sixth form but I also didn't do very well at that either right um I I started a couple of A levels but I didn't really get to the point where I realized I was going to pass them mm. so I actually only did the first year of the A levels yeah yeah so at the end of that school year um when I was looking for a, a real job, a proper job, I worked full time at Woolworths, um, and I got moved to the green grocery counter then, actually, which was a lot more fun than makeup. Surprisingly, it was busier. There was more to do, more customer interaction, yes. and, and I really liked it a lot better. Yes, and I applied for a job in the civil service. Right, um, and I got a job I got into the civil service at one of the junior clerical grades um and I remember the the personnel manager at Woolworths saying to me what well, why do you want to go to the civil service it's really hard to work in an office you you you're doing well here why don't you stay here mm. and I was like shop assistant no no civil servant that's me Right. Um, so yeah, so that was the start of almost was that, twenty. Was that the council then? No, it was central government rather than local authority. Oh, central government! Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I worked for the Department of Environment for a while. Um, I worked, and these were just junior clerical jobs. Sure, sure. Um, but I worked on the admin for. Um, the planning application when they wanted to extend Birmingham Airport. Yes. That that was, what year was that? That was pre-1980s, so 76, 77. Yes. 78, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I worked on a, in the Department of Environment to do with planning and then for a little while I had something to do with housing. So that was kind of looking after the, the funding um, housing Association grants for um, what well, it's called registered social landlords now, isn't it? But yes. um, housing, it was housing associations back then. So kind of like that in between bit between council housing and private sector housing, the sort right. of voluntary sector housing. Um, I did some admin work on the funding for those for that type of housing. Mm. Um, yeah, then I moved to the Department of Transport. Right. Um, where I used to prosecute people who didn't have their car tax. Yeah. Or vehicle excise duty, as it was officially called. Yes. Um, yeah, so that, actually, that wasn't quite my introduction to public speaking, but that was a lot of time spent public speaking because I was standing up in the magistrate's court right. uh, putting the cases you know saying this vehicle has been seen in this location and it doesn't have its car tax and these are the checks we've officially done so yeah so I got used to standing up in front of a, it wasn't a big audience it was you know three magistrates usually yes. um, but people were allowed to come into court and listen and yeah. obviously if you were the prosecuting officer you still had to do your stuff no matter how full the court was yes um so yeah so i guess that was my introduction to public speaking really in the civil service great great <laughs> so how long were you in the civil service for almost 20 years in total 20 wow yeah yeah well 19 and a half technically i think <laughs> 20 is fine yeah yeah 20 years. yeah what what made you get out <laughs> um i've been unhappy for a long time i think 
I started to realise that, well, first of all, it was in the Thatcher years. Yes. And that did not gel with my politics. Right. Um, I had a, a falling out with my manager. Um, the management practices there in that one particular part of the organisation were horrendous. I mean, I was bullied. I was bullied at work mm. for quite a long time. Yeah. Um. I, I mean, I did get transferred out of there, but was still a civil servant. But obviously that was kind of another, well, this is a, a reason why I don't want to be working here. I, I'd been unhappy for quite a long time, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting because, just to interject there, Yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean because I worked for one company for a long time, although the, you know, the, the bosses kept changing. But the kind of era that you're talking about, things were very different. I'm sure Carol goes on now, but I mean, people that were in charge felt that their only way of management was to bully workers. Yeah. Uh, it was just the known behaviour that then aspiring managers got to copy as well. Yeah, and yeah. And it, it, was, it was dreadful. And I know exactly what you mean because I went through that period as well and I want, I need to get out of here. But also, it wasn't, people stayed in jobs much longer, didn't they? It's not like now people are just swapping around like left, right and centre, but people did stay in their careers for much longer. I mean, you were in that for 20 years and then it becomes yeah. very difficult to go, well, I want to move, but I've been here for 20 years. How do I get out? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there certainly was an element of that. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, you're a civil servant. It's a good, it's a steady job. You know, you've got yes. security. Yes. And I think, I mean, you know, I had a, there's 10 years age gap between my daughter and my son. But, you know, I had a small child. We had a mortgage. Mm. We were already, you know, we'd had interest rates going up to 15%. Um, mm -hmm. and, and luckily our mortgage at the time wasn't massive, but, it, you know, we had bills to pay. So you start to think that you can't leave a good job that's paying you good money. Yeah. Um, so you do find that you're, you're a little bit stuck. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And to be honest, that feeling is what kind of brings me to the business that I'm promoting now. Mm. You know, the, you know, this being bullied at work is relevant to what I'm doing now. Yes. Well, we it won't is, go. We won't go on to that fine. yet. Yeah. Um, so, how did you get out, and what did you do next after the civil service? Um, well, how I got out. I, I mean, I'd been looking for work for quite a long time and I had interviews but no job offers um how I actually got out was when I was on maternity leave with my son as I say there's nearly 10 years age difference between the two the there was another round of we need redundancies we need cuts in the civil service we, we've got a you know we were still it might have been John Major by then. I've, I can't remember the, how the dates line up. But, you know, we were under a Conservative government that thought they needed to cut the civil service numbers. Mm. Um, so they're asking for voluntary redundancies. And I was still on maternity leave and I, I just stuck my hand up and I was like, yep, yeah, me, I'll take that. I, 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 you know, I'm happy to not come back. And at first, I was refused that because they said that the post I was in wasn't a redundant post. Yeah. The, you know, the, the unit that I worked at wasn't where they were looking to make cuts. Well, I'd been a trade union committee member. Um, I'd been involved in the trade union for probably 10 years or more. Yes. Not that I think that's the reason that they acted for me, but no. it, it did make me sort of say to the union, hang on, this has happened. It makes no sense to me. They agreed. 
and put the argument that if there was somebody who wanted to go on a voluntary redundancy and they wouldn't let them go and then they started to have to make compulsory redundancies elsewhere the union would not be very happy and Mm. why was it not a logical thing to say that they could then move someone who was at threat under threat of redundancy who didn't want to go offer them my job makes 100 percent sense of course it's such a simple thing, but mm. apparently it needed the union to point that out to them. Mm. So, yes, I did get redundancy, voluntary redundancy at that time. Um, and I used the settlement, you know, the redundancy payout that I got um, to give me a, a sort of financial cushion to get some experience in the voluntary sector because I wanted to work in the voluntary sector. Right. Um, yeah, so that's that's how I made the shift, really. Um, so from voluntary were... redundancy to the voluntary sector. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And any particular yeah. area of the voluntary sector did you go into? Um, it's been a bit of a meandering path, if I'm yes. honest. Yes. I started off as a, a Citizens Advice Bureau advisor. Right. Um, as a volunteer. Um, and I quite liked that. And I was good at it. Uh, the manager of the bureau um, thought I was good at it too and thought I was wasted in admin work. And she put me forward for a temporary contract. Right. It was six weeks paid work with them. And that was to work with, specifically with people who'd been referred with mental health issues. Right. And I was a little bit, I don't know if I can work with people with mental health issues. It's a bit sort of front line and a bit specialist for me. I'm not sure. But she encouraged me and I thought, actually, it's six weeks. So, you know, if it turns out not to be for me, it's only six weeks. That turned into almost a year. (laughs) Um, and by the end of it, I was so stressed and so I'm probably suffering from mental health issues myself mm. um, that I, it just it just wasn't for me. No. And I think part of that is that dealing with that particular client group wasn't really for me. Yes. But also it was, again, about the work practices and you know, as, as you probably know, the voluntary sector is very underfunded, very stressed, works a lot on people's goodwill. Even yeah. the paid staff do more than they're actually being paid for. And there's a culture of that within the voluntary sector, with not every organisation, obviously, but within a lot of charities and non-profit organisations, there's a culture of you know, well, you've got to do this because otherwise these people are suffering. And it kind of plays on your guilt and you you, yes. you feel mm. that you have to do that. Yeah, yeah. And back then I didn't know any better. I didn't know as much about, you know, taking care of myself. And, and bear in mind, you know, at this point I still had a small child and the 11 or 12-year-old, you know, so I still had domestic responsibilities, things to do at home, mm. you know, juggling childcare, making sure they got to childminder, got to school on time. So, yeah, it, that was a really stressful year in well, hindsight. That, the home life adds to the work life stress and it just becomes overwhelming, doesn't it? The whole, the, 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 the kind of demands on your life. Um and as you said, you you didn't have the resources then to be able to look after yourself in a better way. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's easily done, and I totally take your point about the charity sector because if you are working even as a paid staff member, you have a charitable mind uh, because you want to yes. do almost charity, and that includes you know not getting the being underpaid often, uh, yeah. being expected to do more, 
uh, than is yeah. required. Uh, yeah, totally understand that. Yeah. So what what yeah. happened then? How did you get away from that? Um, it the temporary contract came to an end. So, and I just at that point knew that I didn't want to continue working in the mental health field not as a frontline worker because it was just too hard and I was just too stressed and I actually I think when you add in the you know the previous bullying at work that I'd had the the home life stress and then the the stress of trying to deal with that particular job uh, my confidence really took a nosedive Yes. And I ended up in a quite a low paid admin job. It was still in the voluntary sector. It was for another small charity project. And I started off, I quite liked it. Um, and then the woman that I was working for there re revealed herself to be a bully as well. Wow. <laughs> Um, yeah, I really, you know, I thought we were getting on okay. And then one day somebody came into the office, the, the BT engineer came into the office to do some, um, you know, wire something up. I can't even remember what. And I apparently dared to speak to this BT engineer and possibly give him some instruction about what we were after. And after he'd gone, the manager just really laid into me. It wasn't my place to say that. It wasn't my place to speak to him in that way. And, I, you know, I was just there. To, I was just the hired help. Yeah, yeah. And I was stunned. I was like, what? I, what? <laughs> you know, why are you speaking to me like I'm a 16-year-old just out of school who knows nothing? And in actual fact, looking back now, she shouldn't have spoken to a 16-year-old just out of school like that. No. You know, she just... She just really laid into me and I was absolutely stunned because I'd had no inkling before then that there was any problem. Mm. Um, and after that, you know, there were other things. So having learned my lesson from being bullied previously and staying there for a, a good couple of years mm. un in an unacceptable situation, this time I only stayed for four months. <laughs> and I did find another job in the charity sector um, right. for a small health charity and I had thought it was an admin job but it actually turned out to be more like a fundraising job right there, there was a lot of good things about this particular job in the long run mm. but that also started off quite badly because the, the there was a new manager. And it was going to be just the two of us. There was like him and me as his assistant working together to man a fundraising office for a small health charity. Yes. And on my first day, he was off sick. Right. <laughs> so, so I arrived new into an office, no manager, uh, a couple of the consultants or and the, i think the consultant and her pa helped me sort of settle up and you know get settled into the office you know gave me a key told me you know roughly like you've got this this and this yes and said that the new manager had apparently told me to just organize the office and i'm like what but what <laughs> 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 so I was literally thrown in deep end, having to work it out, make it up as I went along. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. Well, <laughs> I think now I would just be, okay, that's fine. But yes. bear in mind, my confidence is low. I yes. just had, you know, a 20-year career that I ended up leaving because I was being bullied and mm. then I had a another job that stressed me out so much and then I had another job where I was bullied again so I don't think I had got a lot of reserves at that point understandable yeah however he did come in and we start eventually you know he had this sick leave and then he came into the office and you know we started to develop a bit of a working relationship 
that I think lasted maybe a couple of weeks. <laughs> and then he had a breakdown. He literally just never showed up at work one day. Right. Uh, he didn't bother to phone me. He didn't bother to phone the charity's head office. That ended with the uh, chief executive of the charity coming up. I mean, eventually I was the one who had to phone head office and say, um, I don't know where he is. He hasn't phoned in sick. Um, so they sent the chief exec to come and talk to me and to try and have a meeting with him. And apparently he'd agreed to a meeting, uh, but he didn't turn up to that either. No. So, so the chief exec had come up from London to meet with him and he just basically didn't show up for that. Yeah. So obviously that was the end of him. Yes. Um, and I was on my own in that job for five months before they appointed another manager. Right. Oh, why didn't they appoint you? Well, I did apply. I did apply, I know. And that's the thing, isn't it, is you start sort of thinking, well, yeah, I can do this. I know, I know. It's and happened to me as well, Lindsay. It's happened yeah, to me as well. Yeah. I had to, oh, I know. I, I mean, often you have to leave the company and then they realise, they go, oh, well, they could have done it. I should have hired them. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. To be fair, they did apply, They did appoint someone who'd been a trustee of the charity for a longish time. Yes. Um, and who'd got a lot of business experience. Mm. And I got on really well with him. We worked together for... I can't remember now, was it two years or four years? Something like that. I worked for that charity then for yes. a decent-ish period. Yeah. Um, and I left there to go to uni. And it's the charity's own fault, really, that that happened. Yes. <laughs> because we had a we had a charity event. Um Actually, maybe it was two years I stayed there because we had we'd had a charity event the one year, uh, a charity ball, and it's the first time I'd ever really been involved in anything like this. And it was such hard work, and myself and the the, the boss, literally the whole evening, were just running around, organising, sorting things out, making sure everybody else was doing what they were supposed to be doing. I think I did manage to get a bite to eat at some point, but they'd got a tarot card reader. Right. Uh, this this woman actually worked for Birmingham Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she said, oh, yeah, I can do tarot readings. So, like, okay, if you... Oh, it was a Halloween ball. That's right. So that's why the tarot was sort of, it would be good to have tarot readings. Yes. So, and she was charging like £10 to have a tarot reading and then obviously giving that to the charity. Yeah. And I really wanted to go and have my tarot read, even though I don't believe in this stuff. It's like, but I want my tarot read. Yes. Um, And the first year no chance i've got no time for anything like that but mm. the second year we got things organized a little bit better because obviously we got more of an idea of what we were doing mm -hmm. so i did get my tarot read and she flipped the card over the first card and she said you're looking for something and without missing a beat, thinking about it or anything at all, I just said, yeah, what to do with my life? Because at that point, I think I'd realised that sort of being an admin, being the fundraiser, you know, the, the events fundraiser, it wasn't what I wanted my career to be. No. And she was like, you know, if she says you're looking for something, as I say, it literally came out of my mouth, yeah, what to do with my life. Yeah, yeah. And she said things like, yeah, your family have always been in your way and that's prevented you from doing what you want to do and there is something out there for you and when when you find it, you when you know what it is, nothing will stop you, nothing will get in your way. Now, I know that's not a fortune. I know that's not like... 
she's seen into a crystal ball and she knows that and knows you could have said that to anybody and it would have made sense. Yes. But it did actually just make so much sense to me. You were ready to hear it, weren't you? That yeah. was it. You yeah. were just 100% ready to hear it. Yeah. 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 Mm. And it bugged me for about a week then. It's like, well, if it's out there, why haven't I found it yet? What is it? What is it? What is it? Mm. And then one morning, just I think it was a Sunday morning as I was getting out of bed, um, go to university. It just literally pops into my head. Yeah. And it was something that, you know, I'd often said, oh, I wish I'd been able to go to university. Oh, yeah, I wish I'd love to go to university. But I didn't think we could afford it when we were, you know, first married and we had the mortgage and, you know, we needed my income. Um, you know, when I was in the civil service, I had a really good income. But we'd got to the point where my income was now just part-time income and my husband's business was doing okay and we didn't actually really need my, a second income. Um, so, yeah, so I had to persuade my husband that we could afford it because he was worried about it. Um, and also I needed him to pay for it, <laughs> if the truth's known, um, which he did. And, you know, I... At that point, that's, I applied and I, I got into Birmingham University and I read Ancient Medieval History and I absolutely loved it. It was brilliant. Wouldn't have missed it for the world. Brilliant. And and where did that interest come from, the kind of history thing then? I think it's something I'd always been interested in. Um, I remember... Actually, I, d I can remember a history teacher. You know, when you're at school and you have that, you have to choose your topics that yeah. you're going to do for O level. Well, it was O level that back then. And there was there's always like a little bit of a trade off of you know, well, this is on the timetable at the same time as this, so you can only do one or the other of them. But I think sort of at the point where I was choosing, we'd got a really good history teacher and I was really enjoying. We were doing uh, a little bit of sort of economic history, uh, sort of, you know, medieval, the peasant revolution and all that, you know, what Tyler, that kind of period. And I was really interested in that. Yeah. So I chose to do history. So I, did, I got a history O level. But right. then after that, it was just, a, you know, I'd often read... Like I've read books about sort of local Birmingham history, you know, like right. the Lunar Society, you know, Matthew Bolton and James Watt and Darwin and all that sort of stuff that's yes. going on around here. Yeah. I, it was just something that I I was interested in. Mm, mm. And then we were actually, me and my husband were actually away on a weekend break in Rome and – he, we were on the uh, Palatine Hill, and I was like, "Oh, this is so interesting! I'm really loving this." And he looked across at one point at this. We were standing one, on one side of a hill, um, and across you could see like the ruins of a, what was obviously a really big building. It was obviously something quite significant. Um, and he said to me, "Is that where Julius Caesar was assassinated?" Wow. And I looked at it and I said, I don't know. And I realised I was so upset that I didn't know. <laughs> Which I know sounds ridiculous. Um, that I just thought, I've got to do ancient history. I've, I've got to do like the ancient Roman history because that is my biggest interest in history. I just absolutely was fascinated by all the political stuff that went yeah. on back then yes so that's why i decided to do history right <laughs> um and again everybody sort of said oh what are you gonna do afterwards are you gonna teach and i was like what with all those kids i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> you know it was the history that interested me not what i was going to do with it at the end of it yeah 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 so that's that's how i 
got into ended it. Ended up making and the decision, yeah. Was it like two or three years or? It was a three year, yeah. It wow. was, um, it a, was a massive full time, time commitment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, it wasn't like 9,000 a year then. It was, uh, it cost just over a thousand a year. Yeah, which is, more re- is much more reasonable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And as, as I say, my husband actually paid for it. Mm. Um, but I told him it was a, a decent trade off because he only had his business because I'd in, invested some of my redundancy money from the civil service in yeah. him getting his business off the ground. Yeah. yeah. So I figured it was a fair trade. Yeah. Yeah. I think I might have milked it a little bit more than um, I should have done since then. But, you know. That's um, that's marriage for you, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so three years out of you know, not having to work, but in, in enjoying the education of history, um, yeah. which is brilliant. And then when that finished, when you graduated, what did you have some plans whilst you were? In university, what you might do, or did you then decide after you finished? To be honest, I I spent a lot of time thinking. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Yes. Um, and it was a, a kind of. I suppose I'm going to have to go back into the voluntary sector because right. I literally couldn't think what else I could do. Yes. And. I, I'll be honest, I had a little bit of an identity crisis when I finished. Mm. I, I really kind of thought, I don't know, mm. because I'd got this thing that I'd loved it so much. Um, going on to do a master's would have not been very practical, no. you know, because that was a lot more expensive um, and I still wouldn't have been earning any money and, you know, I still wouldn't know what I was going to do at the end of it. Yes. So that that wasn't really a, a realistic possibility as much as I probably would have loved doing that. Sure. So I did actually end up back in the voluntary sector. That's fine, yeah. I, I, I went back to the guy that I'd worked with at the, the charity that I'd got on with really well. He'd moved on and he was now... Uh, head fundraiser for another small fundraising health charity. And I just went and did some voluntary work with him for a little while uh, because obviously I didn't want to be sat at home doing nothing. Yes. And and, and by this time my son was at school. Um, my daughter was at university by this time. My last year at uni was her first year at uni. Mm. Mm. Uh, so she'd moved away. She was living in Cheltenham. Right. My my son was still at school, but he was about nine years old, ten years old, something like that. So he was, you know, I mean, obviously I still had to take care of him, but he was at school. Um, I had free time. So, yeah, so I went and did some voluntary work and then started job hunting again. Yes. And I was eventually offered a, a fantastic job, probably the best paid job that I've ever worked in. Mm. Um, and it was for a, an environmental charity. Uh, it was a sort of federal organisation. And the job was teaching people about fundraising. Wow. Wow. And I was a bit, I had a bit of imposter syndrome. Mm. How can I teach these people about fundraising? Because, you know, I've not really done that much of it. I've only been an assistant fundraiser at this small other health charity. Yeah. Um, And I'd got no training qualifications or experience. But I think the manager there just saw something in me that was the teacher Mm. and when I say teacher I do mean in that sort of looser you know wanting to support people and help people to do what they do 
to the best of their ability. Yes. Because, as I say, I'd always made flippant jokes through uni about your know, teaching with all those kids. No. Mm. And, and I, I just dismissed the idea of teaching. Yeah. But I discovered that I really loved training. I yes. call it training rather than. But I also quite like the sort of one to one of, you know, a conversation with someone and helping them to see something from a different point of view yes. and helping them to, you know, develop and grow in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that job really gave me the opportunity to, to develop those skills and experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I really enjoyed it there for a long time. And then, so how long all in all did you spend then in the charity sector? Uh, that was also about 19 years. Wow. How interesting. Well, actually, no, I tell a lie because okay. that includes that includes the gap in the middle where... Okay, okay. so it takes three years uni. off. Yeah, takes three yeah. years off. Yeah. Okay. Right, so 17 years, still a decent amount of time. So you're quite yeah. knowledgeable about the charity sector then? I think so, yeah. 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 And I mean, I've done a lot of different things. Mm. Um. I I stayed in that job that I loved for about four years, but that job changed and things changed there and I decided it, the time was right to move on. And there, there's so much serendipity, really. So and I realise as I'm telling all these kind of pivotal moments yes. that they've really stuck in my head <laughs> because – there was another one. I I was on a teacher training course um, that I'd I think I'd actually paid for it myself because things had changed in the job and they no longer wanted me to be pursuing that as a, an option. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd invested into it so much time and realised that you know this is, yeah I really want to be able to do this. And, you know, training, I really want to develop myself as a trainer. So I think I paid for the course myself. Um, and I was a, about three months from the end of it when they wanted me to start working full time because uh, I was on four days a week there. Yeah. And full time just wasn't feasible because as well as the course, I also needed to do 75 hours teaching practice a year mm -hmm. for two years and obviously I was about three months from the end of the two years so I still I, but I'd still got quite a lot of teaching practice to squeeze in yeah so working full-time just wasn't going to be practical sure um so I decided to hand in my notice um and the, the you know the nature of the work had changed and I wasn't enjoying it as much anyway so I decided to hand in my notice and I sat down at my computer to type out my resignation letter. And you know that wonderful procrastination technique of, oh, I'll just check my emails before I do what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and I opened up my emails and there was um, an email there that says, are you happy in your work? Mm. And so I started to laugh and I could see who it was from. And it was from the boss of the small charity where I'd worked before I went to uni. Yeah. So, you know, a boss that I liked and respected. But I assumed it was a joke one. And, you know, I was expecting to see like cartoons when I opened up the email. But it didn't. It said his fundraiser was leaving so they had a job opportunity and he wondered if I'd be interested in it. Oh, right. This is when I've just sat down to write my resignation letter. Wow. So that's what I say, serendipity. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I told him, uh, funny you should ask. So I applied for that job and, you know, the trustees of that charity interviewed me, but they offered me the job. So, yes. okay, great. It was part-time, three days a week. Right. So it left me enough time to finish my teacher training. Mm, brilliant. 
And I worked there for just under 12 months. And I'm sorry to say that that ended badly as well. Oh, my God. (laughs) Stop it now, Lindsay. (laughs) No more. Well, funnily enough, there there are no more. Oh, good. (laughs) Because when I left that job, and I did apply for a few jobs, um, and I, I interviewed for a few, but a friend persuaded me, look, Lindsay, you've been saying for a long time that you'd love to work for yourself. Why don't you, you know, you've been made redundant. Just, you know, start something now. Yeah. And I was a little bit sort of, oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, you know, it's too soon and I haven't got the experience. And if I start a business, what in? I didn't even know what business to start. But no. in the end, that is what I did. Um, I went on a – back then, they were still offering um, – I, I mean, I signed on. It wasn't quite as, um, I don't know, draconian, I suppose, is maybe the right word. Uh, it wasn't quite as micromanaging your job search. I'm talking about – it's probably about 10 years ago now. Yes. Um, so I signed on. But I discovered that they had a program, an eight-week course, where instead of signing on, you actually got paid uh, a given amount to start a business. So it was was something like £200 a month, I think, which was similar to the amount that you got if you signed on. Yes. So I did that course and I worked as a freelance fundraiser for a while. Right. Um, and I also, as part of that, did a little bit of training, fundraising training. I did a few sort of one-off, one-day workshop type things. And I also worked for a little while as um, a lecturer at Coventry Uni. Mm. Uh, I, I did a um, like a one-semester module in charity fundraising. Right. Um, which I really liked, and they did ask me to look at the permanent job that they were uh, recruiting for, but I didn't really Mm. fit all of the criteria for the permanent job. And also I was a bit sort of, I don't know if I want to go back into permanent jobs again now. No. So, yeah. So that was my lecturing career. That was fairly brief. (laughs) <laughs> but I did, I, that was good I really enjoyed that but it's all you know interesting thing is it's and I often have this when I when I listen to people's stories and they talk me through how things have unfolded throughout their career in there somewhere you can tell and hear that people are being prepared for what they eventually are going to be doing yeah, for themselves, yeah. right? So yeah. in all of the kind of, oh, no, I don't want to be a teacher, ending up being a lecturer <laughs> and a trainer, <laughs> you know, it's like be careful what you don't want to wish for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they say that, don't they? Yeah. That, you know, everything that you say that you don't want, your brain actually hears the thing that you're saying and it doesn't acknowledge that you're saying, I don't want this. Correct. You know, I don't want to think of a pink elephant. Oh no, now look what's in my brain. It's a pink yes. elephant. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so you set up your own business then? Yes. And and it's called Sylvan Training. And so tell us let's dive into that well and truly. Um, what does the business do? Um, how long has it been going? And, and what do you enjoy so much about it? Okay. Well, this is probably the most difficult question you've asked me. Yes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have actually spent probably about three or four years trying to work that out. Um, and yeah, so back to the, you know, if I have my own business, what will it be? I don't know what that will look like. And it has taken me a long time, really, and a lot of different 
things to try out, a lot of different approaches. Mm. But my aim is to help people who don't like their jobs. I mean, I hope you can tell from the, the stories that I've just shared that yeah. I've been through some terrible jobs and I've also been through some really good jobs that I've loved. Yeah. And I, I think one of the most important things in life is meaningful work. Yes. You know, it's so intrinsic to our identity. Like, as I said to you, when I finished uni, I had a bit of a, an identity crisis because, you know, I, I was no longer a mature student. What was I? You know, I, I didn't have a job that I could say I'm, you know, I'm a civil servant or I'm a fundraiser or I work for this charity. Or, I, I I struggled. And, it, you know, when we meet somebody new, they say, oh, and, and what do you do? Mm -hmm. It's such an intrinsic part of our identity. And I feel it's really important to be able to be proud of your answer. Yes. And I also know that a lot of people are stuck in jobs that, you know, they they feel, oh, you know, it's, it's tedious, it's boring. I don't get on with the people that I work with. I don't like my boss. My boss is stupid. My boss doesn't know what they're doing. And I think part of what I've learned over the past, yeah, probably 10 years has been that you have to take responsibility for your own personal development. Yeah. And that that's, yeah, that sort of learning the self-awareness that goes with that is really important to me as an individual. But I also think that should be important to everybody. Mm. You know, what, what do you want to learn? What do you want to get out of life? What does your job do? to help you towards that yeah and if it's not doing anything well then make a change yeah so my business now really is about helping people to learn those things for themselves because it, it don't matter how many times i tell them or you tell them or any other self-development guru out there tells them mm. you know you can read Anthony Robbins, Grant Cardone, James Clear, Dwayne, Wayne Dwyer, Dyer. I mm -hmm. always get his name wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, there's loads of them out there. You can listen to them and read them, but until you actually learn it and experience it for yourself, it's, it's philosophy. Not make, it's philosophy it's, until you experience it yourself. 100%. Yeah. yeah. It's philosophy. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's important to take ownership for your own. And and one of my big sort of bugbears really about the self-development genre is there's this thing about, you know, positive thinking and, you know, put a positive spin on it. And I'm making it sound a bit more flippant than they do. But one of my frustrations for a long time was, but I'm trying, I'm trying to do all these. Why isn't it working? I'm trying. Mm, mm, mm. And I think it, sometimes it's the wrong message. You know, it, it's no good saying to somebody, focus on this. If their brain is focusing on something else, mm. you've got to actually make those changes and probably the biggest lesson i've learned in the last year is you've got to start really small start yeah. with something tiny yeah give yourself a bit of proof that you can succeed yeah and once you've got that bit of proof that you can succeed you can then build on that with the next thing and the next thing yeah so my business is about helping people to to learn those things for themselves yeah and so it's giving them the awareness and maybe some skills to get started in taking responsibility 
for their own personal development. Yes. Yeah. Would that be the right kind of summing up from everything I've just heard? I think, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I probably haven't used it in quite that way in my marketing. No. Um, but, but I might what, do. <laughs> no. And the thing is, there's um, I often share on this podcast the guy that I discovered a few years back. Cool. I, I, I have trouble pronouncing his name because it is quite a difficult surname, but it's Leo Babuta, I'll say. He's in California. And oh, right. I think he, I think he may be British. And he, um, he's got a website called zenhabits.net, and he talks about the tiny, tiny steps to take when you're looking to make any kind of change in your life. If you know the kind of change you want to be making, everybody gets at that point at some time during their life. But if you start with tiny, small steps, then that will give you better results in the longer term. Because what people people go for massive changes, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and then they they change quickly but they fail quickly as well. And then they won't change again because they go, it isn't working. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and the other bit that you mentioned about, I mean, one of the reasons this, this particular podcast exists, and that's why you're such a great guest on it, is that the whole purpose is to hear from business owners who um, at some stage were unhappy in their job <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and decided to go it alone. You know, and and there are lots of people who are unhappy, who have an idea, are too afraid to get started. But when they hear stories like your story, they'll get inspired and go, actually, yeah, I've listened to Lindsay and she's done it. And why can't I do it? I'll have a go as well then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I totally think that, you know, if, if that's the way you want to go, if you want your own business, then do it. Mm do it it's not easy i'm not ever going to pretend it's easy and i'm sure like, i mean i've only listened to a couple of your previous guests mm. but i'm sure others will agree that it's not an easy thing to do but anything that's worth doing it's not easy anyway is it if it's that's easy right. there's no you know there's no fun in it there's no point is there no no and at least the effort that you're putting in you know you're putting it in for yourself not for some other you know, person at the top of the tree who is, is, I'm not suggesting they all have it easy, but somebody somewhere is having it easy uh, based on the work that somebody in the organization is doing for, for them. So, yeah. um, and, and reaping the rewards, at least if there are rewards to be reaped, which there will be, then at least those are the rewards that you will own and not somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but there is another aspect, isn't it? Apart from that, which is so necessary and well done for, you know, being there for helping individuals with that. But you also do a lot around speaking, don't you? Public speaking, I, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't do a lot of paid public speaking. Uh, one thing that I do spend quite a lot of my time doing, you see, I'm still in the voluntary sector. Yes. I am a member of Toastmasters International, yep. which sounds like a really formal thing, but actually it's a members club. Uh, my club is Boring Speakers. Uh, that's boring as in Birmingham Boring. Yeah. So Boring Speakers, it's a non-profit organisation. Uh, it's an educational uh, non-profit to help people with their communication skills. Yeah. So developing confidence in public speaking and also helping to develop leadership skills. And it's an absolutely fabulous organisation. I mean, the meetings are just always so interesting. You're hearing people's stories all the time. Yes. Admittedly, not in as long a chunk as I've just given my career history. No. Uh, you know, it's usually most speeches are five to seven minutes long. That's right. But it does really help people to develop the confidence to stand up and speak in front of an audience. Mm. 
Um, so, yeah, if, if anybody's interested in that, we meet um, twice a month on a Monday evening at the Novotel on Broad Street in Birmingham. Yes. Um, for listeners who are not Birmingham-based, uh, the clue's in the name. It is Toastmasters International. Google it. There's there's clubs all over the world. Yeah. So I and and I concur because that's where I started to learn my public speaking skills at Toastmasters. Oh wow, where yeah. at? The 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 Solihull chapter Heart Speakers. Oh, uh, right. I yeah. did not know that. No. Uh, oh, fabulous. Many, many years ago, it was. It was in the 2000 and, yeah, it's about 15 years ago. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, I still remember that I had to do my first speech there because it's a structured way of learning speaking. It is, yeah. And it, the first speech was to talk about yourself, right? Seven yes. minutes to talk about yourself. Still is. Yeah, and it yeah. still is. And I was still employed at the time and I was driving from, I lived in Warwickshire and I was driving to Mansfield for my commute, like an hour's commute. And I was practicing my speaking in the car. There was no one else in the car with me. So yeah. I, was, I was going to speak that evening and I was practicing it in the morning. And this this is how the brain I, I got the realization on many levels in that drive, that commute, the brain, I got butterflies as I was doing the practicing because my yeah. brain, because I visualized myself standing in front of people and my brain thought I was there in front of people. So my physiology in my body was telling me that I was nervous, that I was having butterflies. And it made me realize that actually, Whatever you think about, your body believes it's true. Yes. And yeah. um, so that, that got me off on a whole other train of thought. <laughs> but yes. it, was, it was an in incredible experience, yeah. And I, I think I ended up being the president eventually for a short while there. But it, oh, was, wow. it was really, really good fun. Yeah. Really yeah. Fun. It's a fabulous organisation. And, and if you think, you know, some people's – spend hundreds going on a course in public speaking um, and then they never get the chance to practice. Mm. Whereas if you join Toastmasters, you get the opportunity to practice a couple of times a month. You know, every time you go to a meeting, you get the opportunity to practice yeah. in front of an audience. Yes. And the cost of it, it it's ridiculously cheap. I mean, our membership is still uh, £60 for six months. Yeah. That's pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a very safe environment as well to practice with. It is. Yeah. 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 We Wi-Fi. like to think that we're very friendly and welcoming yeah. and, you know. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Oh, wow. And, and you help people a little bit with their public speaking as well, or? Not so much, really, that now. I okay. did. A couple of years back, do a couple of workshops in helping people to develop confidence. I think that right. was when I was trying to work out, you know, what's my offering. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Because I saw some reviews on your LinkedIn about that. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I'm not really promoting that as, you know, I'm not really doing very much in that directly. Okay. Got Although you. part of being happier at work is being comfortable enough to speak up yes so you know it's it's about have you got the confidence to say what you think in meetings have you got the confidence to have a conversation with your manager or a colleague it, you know it's about dealing with conflict mm. sometimes mm. you know if, if you've got an awkward situation what are you going to do are you going to complain about it behind somebody's back you know, is it going to ruin your home life because you're going home and complaining to your family about, do you know what she's done today? Yeah. Or are you going to have a mature conversation with someone um, and explain the problem and ask, you know, for help, ask for what you'd like yeah. done to make matters better? Mm. And, and I do realise that sometimes those conversations don't work because it's tough, it, isn't it, relies, it? Yeah. it relies on the other person as well. But 
you, you, you've got a choice about how you respond mm. to other people. Mm. So going home and complaining and doing nothing about it is rarely the best thing to do. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so it, it does involve having the confidence to speak up in difficult situations. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. And, and Lindsay, what's the... So when when we started talking about your business and what you do for people, you said it was the hardest question. Do you still think it's the <laughs> hardest question after we fleshed it out? Uh, hopefully not. No. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> I think it's because it, it's still still a number of different avenues that I can pursue and, you know, finding the one that's the most effective. Yeah. But I, I am working on an online course. Um, I'm going to be running some webinars over the next um, month or so and from there develop an online course. Brilliant. That's directly addressing those issues of, you know, what's making you miserable at work. Let's see what we can do you know, help you to learn, as I say, for yourself, what you can do about it. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, be there for a support because, you know, we all need support to make big changes. Yeah. And and it sounds fantastic doing that course. 100% agree with that route. And also, I think being in your own business, not, you know, pivoting into something else or changing direction is much easier because you've only got yourself or a few other people to convince and i've had to do that yeah. in my in my you know running my own business many times and who yeah. knows who knows whether i'll still stick with what i'm doing but <laughs> i've had to i've had to pivot you know three or four times before i got to where i am and hopefully what I'm doing today is going to be it. So, but I'm, yeah. I think being flexible and keeping open minded like you are, saying, well, something else might come along. That means I might have to focus on that more. And I, I think it's a journey of discovery, really. Um, it is, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's half the fun of it, really. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's also half the frustration of it. But, it, you know, it is. It is part of the fun of it that, well, how, okay, I've tried this. This didn't quite work out. Um, what can I do to make it better? Yes. What can I do slightly differently? Mm. Um, and I think that's, I guess in a way, it's the lesson we all need to learn, whether we're in business, whether we're in employment, whether we're trying to make changes in our personal lives. It is back to this, you know, slight change, small habits. Yeah, yeah. You know, small changes lead to big things. Yeah. Oh. Okay, Lindsay. So where can people find out more about you online? How can they get in touch with you, more to the point? Okay, um, I'm on LinkedIn that's possibly a good place to start. Yep. I also have a website, uh, sylvantraining.com. So that's silver with an N for November on the end. So it's sylvantraining.com. Yep. I'm on Twitter at sylvantrainuk yep. because somebody had taken silver and training, some Melbourne IT company. How right. dare they? Uh, so silver and train UK on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and also you can find me on YouTube. I yep. do book reviews on YouTube. Right. Uh, so on YouTube, it is youtube.sylvantraining.com or you can just search for Lindsay Milner. Right. Um, am, I, am I anywhere else? Oh, I'm on Facebook as well. Um, I have a Facebook page uh, for Silver and Training. That's not a very active page, but obviously if somebody puts something on there, I will see it and will respond to it. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I'll include all of those links in the show notes as well so people can click through when they're listening. Okay, brilliant. And um, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. 
I've really enjoyed listening to your story and what you're doing in your business today. You're perfectly suited because you've had all of the kind of experience in all of those areas through your own career. Um, Thank you. And, and managed to deal with it and sort it out as well. So well done to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I my, love to talk. So my it's absolute really nice. <laughs> pleasure. And we, we met originally at a Fiverr community event run by Michael Don Smith in Birmingham. So yes. hopefully we'll catch you there next month. Yeah, yeah. It'd be good to see you again. All right. Take care, Lindsay. Thank you. You too. Bye for now. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 